Hello, and welcome to The Charge Cycle, an electrifying new podcast on all things fleet electrification. I'm Todd Trauman. I'm the CEO of Emission Control. If you are a procurement manager, a fleet operator, or one of the millions of people tasked with a zero emission deployment goal, this podcast is for you. We speak with industry experts, funding experts, OEMs, and many others to help you stay ahead of this enormous electrification shift underway. Hello and welcome back to The Charge Cycle, an electrifying new podcast on all things fleet electrification. I'm Todd Trauman, I'm the CEO of eMission Control, and today I am super happy to be talking with Jamie Medill from the ProClean Group. They're one of the most interesting and inspiring groups that I've ever seen. Jamie, CFO turned Director of Sustainability, leads a collective of property restoration companies operating in Western Canada. Without a doubt, Jamie is one of the leading EV uh, experts in electrification and procurement, not only in the restoration industry, but in Canada as well. He's helped all, all seven Proclaim Group offices begin their journey in electrifying fleets while also embedding purpose-driven sustainability practices into their culture. The Proclaim Group is one of the most inspiring and uh, interesting groups that I've ever been with. We were actually able to meet Jamie last week at his facility uh, in Western Canada. Um, Jamie, he's the CFO turned sustainability director. He's right now leading a collective of uh, restoration companies, um, and I'd say without a doubt, he's one of the most uh, impressive leaders in the EV adoption, fleet electrification, and procurement uh, spaces I've uh, I've really ever seen. Um, so I'm really happy to have Jamie here with us today. And uh, I'd all, I'll also add that he's uh, one of the most uh, personally uh, nicest humans I've ever met. So Jamie, uh, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks. That's quite an introduction. Uh, thanks very much. Happy to be here. Thanks, Jamie. Um, give us a little context on your background. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your uh, involvement in the space, kind of talk about uh, really how you got to where you are today and how you arrived really with uh, Proclaim. Yeah, sure. Well, so to start with, our business is, uh, is property restoration, uh, you know, fire and flood uh, through insurance claims. Uh, we uh, have our headquarters in Richmond, British Columbia in Canada. Um, we're about 300 employees across our group in seven offices. Um, we focus on, um, you know, a holistic approach to sustainability in our business. It's something that uh, none of our competition or anybody that in our space really has connected with very much. Um, and uh, we've been doing this for a very long time, uh, you know, caring for the planet and, and diverting waste and, um, trying to uh, enact sustainable business practices in our day-to-day -day has been something we've been working on for you know, a number of years, but really started to take uh, shape in about 2016. You know, started by becoming a climate smart certified business, the first restoration uh, company in North America to have that distinction. And what that means is that we um, track and measure all of our greenhouse gas emissions, our scope one, two, and three emissions, and determine our carbon footprint each year, and work uh, on having a greenhouse gas reduction plan that we adapt uh, and update and enhance every year. We started by just trying to identify our, our major sources of greenhouse gas emissions, and what we found very quickly was our top three uh, in order were, were transportation, at about 65% of our uh, emissions, uh, waste and disposal. Our, our business uh, of you know restoring homes has a lot of demolition. We handle and deal with a lot of waste, and that is about 25% uh, of our uh, overall uh, emissions. And uh, finally, the, we have a large facility, about 50,000 square feet, and so heating and cooling our facility is our third highest uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions. And so. Since 2016, we've been actively working towards reducing our carbon footprint and our emissions um, in order of priority. And so that naturally led us to electrifying our fleet. And so just give us some more context on the company itself. So I, I've been lucky enough to see the part one of the many facilities that you guys have, but uh, give us some context on just the general volume. So you guys are working on uh, tr traditionally residential uh, restoration, but I think there's also some commercial res uh, restoration there. But um, this is a big operation and you guys have a large cabinetry stuff. You guys do a lot of new, f you have a whole flooring subsidiary <laughs> orientated to restoration as well. So um, tell us a little bit more just about the scale of the company, about uh, kind of what you are overseeing here. Yeah, sure. 
We do have seven offices operating in Western Canada. Uh, our, as I said, our flagship is in, in uh, our headquarters are in Richmond, British Columbia. And um, we do uh, anywhere from about uh, 1,200 to 1,500 uh, jobs or claims every year. We're, we're a busy outfit. And uh, it's mostly fire and flood at a residential level. Uh, we do see lots of multi-unit. We do do some commercial uh, restoration. And we're also a purpose-driven company. And I really want to talk about that for a second. Uh, you know, we've, we've defined our purpose as a, as a business, uh, you know, from a social responsibility standpoint, but also, you know, it's given us our reason to exist. And so what I'll tell you is that Platinum Proclaim exists to help others in need by developing people, building communities, caring for the planet, and restoring homes. And if we look at everything we do through that lens and we try to make all of our leadership decisions looking through that lens, uh, you can see that sustainability is kind of woven through that entire statement. Uh, you know, when we talk about developing people, uh, you know, the key to sustainability and keeping employed, uh, you know, employment and is to develop people and to give them a, a career path and something that they can, um, you know, develop and continue to improve and learn and, 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 and that's sustainable because we're not continually onboarding and hiring. And uh, so, you know, if we can retain our staff, that's a, that's a sustainable business practice. Building communities, we talk about, uh, you know, building a community of, uh, you know, EV drivers in, in our own community, but also we build community around ourselves that focuses on our business. In Waste Diversion, we're members of the National Zero Waste Council. I sit on a wood waste subcommittee trying to find useful um, uh, repurposing of, of wood waste that comes out of our, uh, our business operations. And so, you know, that's building community. We are very involved in our community. Um, I, you know, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, we do shoreline cleanups and these kind of things. We build communities around ourselves uh, and, and that is sustainable in itself. Caring for the planet, well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's easy to define from a sustainability standpoint. And then restoring homes. You know, we see uh, the restoration business as the most sustainable industry uh, that there is. You know, we focus on uh, repairing rather than rebuilding or restoring rather than replacing. And so uh, when we when we kind of group all that together and we talk about that as our purpose, uh, it's very easy to see how electrifying our fleet fits into that. Yeah, a lot of things to peel apart. Uh, I think that the uh, workforce development kind of discussion that you're touching on there, I mean, that really just absolutely be just absolutely just seeps uh, out of your guys' organization there. And um, I think that's very, very uh, apparent and something that can be a fantastic model on uh, ultimately what a lot of other groups can see. So uh, kind of to your point on um, restoration and just the business practices itself, uh, you know, I think kind of to your point, there's a lot of potential lip service given in the industry um, out there as far as what is actually being restored or not just being restored, but what is happening with the, uh, the waste streams themselves. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit more about the actual business and kind of what is coming in and, and what is going out and then how is that different than a lot of other organizations in this particular industry? Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, we have a lot of transportation We're we're coming and going from different job sites all day. We've got moving trucks, moving contents from place to place. Uh, that's a big part of, of, of what we're doing, but. Uh, where we really uh, focus a lot of our energy is in diverting waste from the landfill. You know, that's an important part of what we're doing. We're handling and treating a lot of other people's uh, demolition, construction and demolition waste, but also, you know, contents, packaging, drywall, all of these things we're, we're handling. They, we don't own them, but they're part of our business operations. And so what we've tried to do is find as many ways to divert that waste as possible. Um, in British Columbia, we have 26 different extended producer responsibility programs or EPR programs uh, designed to have stewardship over different types of waste streams from tires to solvents to plastic. The most you know uh, familiar EPR uh, program would be uh, returning bottles and cans. And so each one of these uh, diversion streams uh, 
is is a government program. You know, there's there's 26 operating in BC. So what we do is we try to separate at source as many of those things so that we're diverting it from the the, the fragile landfill. You know, that's just something that you know anybody else in our business is not even considering. They're not talking about it. Uh, nobody's asking us to do us do these things. This is entirely voluntary, and it's because we really see it as if we don't do it, who will? Yeah, and you know, I think there's a lot of waste management companies out there. Again, kind of like putting a, a lens on uh, maybe diversion in some way. But if you really want to do it well, you really need to get granular on this. And that's kind of something I wanted to ask. When I think of you know somebody that's not familiar with restoration uh, and what that means, you know, I think of okay, maybe some wood waste, maybe uh, some carpets and things. But there's a lot actually in the mix here that really can clog up the system and have really meaningful impact on uh, climate change ultimately, but certainly just other uh, tertiary effects uh, with landfill filling and everything else. Um, so just, just again, quickly, you mentioned tires and bottles, but you know, I mean, it sounds like the, the, you guys' approach is really is all encompassing. I remember boxes and plastics and bailing and uh, liquids and all sorts of things. So um, kind of what, what are some of those other additional uh, kind of of those 26 different diversionary streams? Like what are some of the big ones? What are the most meaningful um, and really what is being not tackled as much as probably should be uh, across the industry? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, one of the best tools that we have uh, for diverting waste is our baler. And you, you touched on that. So, you know, we handle a lot of cardboard, a lot of paper, a lot of uh, uh, black plastic, clear plastic. We're, we're able to bale those into, into you know, two-ton bricks and then turn that back into a resource or, or it's a commodity. And so rather than paying to dispose of it, we're being paid to recover it and, 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 and you know, enter it, you know, bring it back into the economy in a circular manner. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. We we also have uh, taken this approach in our cabinet shop. We've got a full service cabinet shop, uh, you know, with six full time cabinet makers, some apprentices, and what we've chosen to do there is something that again nobody else is really thinking or talking about or even considering. And that is we've gone completely solvent free. Uh, all of our finishes are waterborne. Uh, we uh, see that as a as you know not only better for the planet but better for our staff that are handling these materials while they're making the cabinets. Less waste too, Less right? waste, yeah, it's much less waste. Uh, all of our, uh, you know, sheet goods, all of the products that we use in our cabinet shop are locally sourced, not, uh, you know, the less expensive brought in from offshore and who knows what manufacturing process is used there. You know, we prefer to use good BC um, plywood and, and uh, sheet goods because they're of higher quality. They're a little bit more expensive, but formaldehyde free, um, you know, just uh, better for for uh, people when we're putting cabinets or kitchens back in in their homes. It's not off gassing. Um, and, you know, trying to really steer away from the, 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 the damaging materials that are out there in our industry, not only for the homeowners that we're helping, but really for our staff as well that are, you know, you know, breathing these things and exposed to them. This all wasn't just flicking a switch, you know, all of these different programs that we have in place, you know, they, when we started in 2016, we actually had all of these ideas. Every one of these things that we do were brought to us from our staff. It's very much a staff mm -hmm. engagement program. And so, you know, things like the baler, I, I would have never even considered a baler if one of my staff, a guy by the name of JP Lambert, amazing guy. I just talked us into it. It was the right thing to do, and, and it's been one of the best moves we've ever made. But you know, switching to a solvent-free uh, cabinet shop, that, that was our cabinet makers brought these ideas to us. They didn't want to be breathing these things in. And so we try to empower or uh, uh, you know, engage our staff in bringing these ideas forward to us as part of our green team um, that we have as well, that you know, bring ideas forward that help us become more sustainable and help us uh, come up with a better way of, of doing business that's more sustainable. Uh, you know, it's not just it's not just from myself. It's in fact, mostly from our staff. So as staff bring these ideas forward and they work and it they the, the rest of the staff see that, you know, we've added this thing, we're doing it, it has an impact. Well, then they bring it self-perpetuating. They're bringing more ideas to the table. We're adopting those things. And then we just 
have over the years just layered on um, new practices. And, uh, you know, when we find success, then we move on to the next one. I, I want to go back to the Baylor thing just one more time because I think yeah, you're sure. touching on something that's really, really interesting. And, you know, a lot of fleets and a lot of companies, frankly, they look at sustainability and they look at uh, these kinds of initiatives that are implemented and they feel like they are kneecapping themselves in a way. They're making an economic uh, sacrifice to be able to do so. But I think with your your point here and one of the things that I think is just absolutely beautiful is that that's not the case at all. It, the idea here is that you can really... Uh, do both. It's not an either or, it's an and ultimately. And so the Baylor is a good example. You turned uh, goods that you were paying to have carted away into a commodity for yourself. So is that kind of a running theme throughout? Does it play hand in hand here? I mean, is how you guys are a private company at the end of the day, right? And so you guys are doing this because you want to, um, you have nothing to prove to anyone else ultimately. Uh, but at the same time, you need to watch what you're doing. And so um, that seems like that's a philosophy that really sits well with you and certainly sits well with the wider organization. I mean, it's not a small company at the end of the day. So um, can you just speak a little bit to that? Talk, I mean, you like you said, you used to inhibit the CFO position here, right? And so you know you know a lot about ultimately what the financial elements um, are and how they're influenced by sustainability programs. So um, just kind of riff on that a little bit. I think a lot yeah, of people would be very sure. interested in hearing about like, you know, the financial impacts of the stuff. Absolutely. Well, you know, uh, as we're handling debris, um, what we decided to do was, you know, just start simply with diverting wood, drywall, and metal. That's where we started because they were simple things to, you know, source separate at the job site. Uh, we were able to set up a, a wood bin and a drywall bin, you know, side by side with our mixed debris. And, uh, you know, anybody that has to deal with waste knows that it's much less expensive to dispose of wood than you know, a, a single stream mixed bin. Uh, mm. Metal is, you know, it's it's a commodity that we get paid for. So separating that is a, is a no brainer. So, you know, I, I feel bad for the guys that are just throwing everything into one bin thinking that they're being, you know, efficient and that it's the right way to do it. They're actually, it's costing them more to dispose of things in that manner. So to talk about the baler, you know, the example I can give you is that and and anybody that has a facility of any size is going to have a roll around bin in their driveway or in their parking lot that's for cardboard you know everybody has a cardboard bin or anybody that handles cardboard does so that you know fills up and and the and the the, the dump truck comes you know once a week and empties that bin whether it's full or not uh and you know the the economics of that or you know it's about 400 to 500 dollars a month to have somebody come and dump your your cardboard bin by having a baler and bailing those things and having the wherewithal to you know stockpile 10 or 12 or 14 bales of cardboard we've eliminated that weekly trip that truck run that that truck coming to our facility so we're keeping vehicles off the road uh, and then every two or you know one or two months we have a large flatbed truck from Cascades Recovery come to our facility. We pay the pickup fee, and then everything that we load onto there is basically a commodity. So cardboard, which goes up and down in value, instead of me paying four or five hundred dollars a month to have somebody take that away, uh, I'm you know paying that flat pickup rate, and then whatever we load on there, cardboard wise, or whatever co cardboard happens to be uh, moving at at that time you know, it comes back to us as a, as a, as, as cash in hand. So, you know, people just have to think about these things a little bit differently. Um, it really doesn't take any more effort. I can tell you that it takes no more effort for our, for our staff to put the debris in this bin as opposed to that bin. It, it literally is, you know, there, it was sure there's some infrastructure at the very start, but once you get these things in place, it's actually much more cost effective and uh, better for the planet by a long way, long mile. mile. Yeah, and that's a good segue too. So you had mentioned kind of scope one, two, and three emissions at some juncture. And so that's a, a you know a very good point to make in that this decision is not just a good financial de decision for you and you yourself are reducing your own scope, I suppose, one or two in by making that particular decision itself. But 
people relying on you and people interacting with you. And as this greenhouse gas world unfolds and people are starting to understand what is happening with other supply chains that they engage with, uh, their ergo their scope three emissions, you yourself making that decision has kind of made their lives easier in a way, right? Um, so I, I, you guys deal with the insurance world as well. Um, I imagine that that is a group that is focusing on ESG and carbon reduction and scope three as much as anyone else. Um, and so can you kind of talk to that a little bit too? It sounds like, you know, you guys, you mentioned you guys are very well planned in, uh, each of these initiatives that you unfold and how you integrate them into your, uh, overall operations are very well thought out. It's not just little onesie twosie things here and there. Um, and so as a result, you know, you guys are able to showcase really, really um, a, a more um, holistic uh, product offering or maybe a, maybe a better way to put that is uh, you guys are able to showcase a, a nice streamlined front as it relates to your understanding of carbon accounting. So yeah. is, that, is that a fair kind of characterization is that or are, are you finding, you know, these things influencing your guys' actual ability to do new business? I think we're just we're you know we're ahead of the industry. The, the the industry isn't quite ready for what we have to offer from from a sustainability standpoint. The insurance industry, much like uh, banks and and oil and gas, they're regulated. They have to report their ESG um, uh, results. Right. What we know and what the insurance industry hasn't quite grasped yet is that the restoration contractors are actually the insurance industry's greatest source of scope three emissions. And so by working with a company that's focused on reducing their emissions, we're actually helping them achieve their net zero targets or their zero emission targets. What I really wanna say here too is that, you know, we're not doing this because it's a great marketing strategy. We, we're not interested in lumping ourselves in with businesses that are, you know, adding a little green leaf to their their logo and greenwashing their business because it's the right thing to do from a marketing standpoint. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. And um, and we're not trying to teach anybody any lessons. We're, we're doing it from personal preference first. Um, and we recognize that this is what the industry we, will require. They need They need us to have these things in place, they just don't recognize it yet, which is kind of a funny thing. Um, so in a way, we have future-proofed our business. Yeah, well, we, I mean, you know, we're south of the border. We're based in California, kind of on the on the tip of this iceberg potentially here. And I think that we start to see it. I know at least uh, interna uh, nationally in the United States, for example, um, if you are a publicly traded company and you're making net zero commitments, and you now have to back that up and you have to report that to the SEC, right? And so I, I think it's only the first iteration of many. And uh, I think this serves as a really good example of that opportunity. It's not necessarily you're doing it for marketing purposes, but you are positioning yourself. And that's kind of another good example of a good business decision at the end of the day um, as a result of t doing the right thing environmentally. You guys are making good business decisions by doing the right thing environmentally because you know ultimately it's coming. I'm sure at some point it will show up on RFPs and you'll need to speak to that, you know, uh, at some at some juncture down the road. But um, I, uh, I think that's a f wonderful example of people that think that they uh, are OK to wait until regulation arrives. Uh, there's no need to that. Uh, no need to do that. I think it's a, a fantastic uh, kind of business model and decision making uh, example that you guys are setting here. Um, Jamie, uh, you had mentioned before in your own carbon accounting, you had associated a certain volume of that towards the transportation side of things. I know that you guys have uh, dug in quite deeply on the EV side. Um, I'd love to talk about that a little bit, maybe starting again with some context on how large the fleet is now. Um, I do want to kind of give some color to that just to put uh, that in perspective for most people. But um, talk to us a little bit more about this electrification journey. Talk to us about what you guys are doing uh, kind of for the wider community there because I think uh, all that is, is wildly inspiring. Yeah, sure. Well, so in 2016, uh, when we became Climate Smart Certified, uh, one of our, you know, our, our accounting manager at the time, a fellow by the a name of Liam Jonas, uh, you know, he just was so passionate about um, EVs. He just, he was like, you know, our, our greatest source of emissions is transportation. I think we need to tackle this. Uh, let's let's try it, you know. And, and at that time, I think we had about 80, 80 plus vehicles. And to be clear, our fleet uh, is a mix of, you know, service vehicles, 
um, you know, kind of uh, medium duty vehicles and then sedan type SUV vehicles. So you've got your administrative staff and our project management teams uh, and our executives driving, you know, sedan SUV vehicles, which really uh, in 2016 were the only type of EV you could get, you know, that's becoming right. more available now. So, so really we, we could only tackle that portion of it uh, when we first set out. We only really had access to sedans, uh, you know, Chevy Volts, Teslas. The, 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 these were the only vehicles available to us in 2016. And only about 25% of our fleet would have been eligible because there was no vans, there was no cargo vehicles available at the time. So the best we were ever going to be able to hit at that time was 25% because that's how our mix was. It was about 75% service and medium and heavy duty vehicles, you know, dump truck, moving truck, cargo vans for our field staff. And, and that's the that's the workhorse of our fleet. Mm. And so, you know, we just started very small. We, we, we you know, with 80 vehicles, we, you know, we've got a pretty robust program of, uh, you know, taking on uh, new vehicles every year. We kind of, you know, take on six, eight, 10 vehicles a year. And so, it was no big deal to introduce a couple of EVs into that. Now, what I would say is that at the time, uh, nobody wanted them. Uh, we, we yes. you know, there was a real pushback. I, like the range anxiety was a real thing. Um, is this so staff too? This like is our staff. Our, at, yeah. yeah, that's right. So our, you know, our staff are like, ooh, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not going to be able to get to work and back. How's this going to work? What if I run out of energy? It just isn't like that, as as you know better than anybody. But you know, so. We combated that by starting with uh, the Chevy Volt, which at the time was a you know a good starter EV, if you will, in that it's got its onboard you know generator for for charging the battery uh, when the when the you know eighty to hundred k of of battery range wore down, um, and so it helped people understand how to use a, an EV. And so starting with a kind of a that uh, plug-in uh, hybrid was a really good starter because it 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 kind of got people used to it we've been kind of brand agnostic with vehicles but you know from from starting with you know three chevy volts in our first year and two level two chargers we just started adding each year we, we you know the following year we had uh, another a uh, couple of chargers so we had five and then we added you know we had nine chevy volts by the end of the second year and then we started to look at uh, you know tesla's tesla was a you know, way ahead of everybody else on the charging infrastructure. Now we're into 2018 and, and we're really starting to see a benefit. Uh, we saw, you know, unbelievable savings in our fuel uh, just there. People started to become more comfortable. They realized that range anxiety was just not a thing that, you know, but they could charge their vehicles while they're at work. They could plug in overnight and they had plenty of range. And so breaking those myths was very simple um, for us because it just naturally happened. People got used to it and they figured it out. And so as we started to see a real uh, remarkable savings in just our fuel purchases, but also a, a, a major reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions, we saw an immediate impact to our annual certification through Climate Smart and our measurement mm -hmm. of our, of our uh, carbon footprint. You know, it, it, it just started to really make sense to us. So we set that target of being 25 percent EV by 2023 uh, as we had access to more uh, types of vehicles uh, you know we, we started to get uh, you know a couple of Ford Escape EVs uh, in this in 2021 we got access to uh, the Ford e-Transit which was the real game changer for us where we were able to you know adopt uh, our service vehicles into our, our fleet um, and then we just most recently purchased a, a three-ton electric moving truck called a Lion 6 that's made here in Canada. And, uh, and we now have 18 chargers, uh, 26 EVs in our fleet, and our fleet is 102 vehicles. So we, we've hit our 25% target. Um, pretty happy about that. We've now set a target of 50% EV by 2026. That may be a little bit more challenging, perhaps a little more aggressive than... We're, but you know you got to set a, a a target that's tough to achieve or not worth it. Yeah, that's a uh, it's it's really uh, incredible too. I, I I think that that's a fantastic goal and extremely achievable with people like you at the helm here, uh, kind of deciding what to do and what to, to pick and how to make it all happen. 
Um, can you uh, talk a little bit too? I, I recall you mentioning uh, some element of public accessibility for your level oh. two chargers you have in your particular parking lot. I thought that was fan- that was really cool um, and a and a good story, but also very good for the community out there that are also struggling with the same sort of questions that you guys are as a business about range anxiety and other sort of issues that kind of come along with this. So um, yeah, can you sure. uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. You know, when when we first installed our our chargers, we were faced with this choice of going with Wi-Fi enabled or just regular level two chargers, and and we chose to go with the less expensive that uh, you know non Wi-Fi enabled that that weren't eligible for a rebate because they were a third the price of the ones that were eligible for a rebate. So it just made good sense to us to buy those. The drawback was that you know they're available to the public. They're they're not uh, you know you didn't have to t- tap an RFID card or anything like that. Tell when they're on and right. Off, so right. <laughs> so we at the very very beginning we made a philosophical decision to uh, make those available to the public. You know we we ask that um, that the general public you know during business hours kind of limit their charging to an hour if they need to top up. But after general business hours and on the weekends we make them wide open uh, for for anybody in our community to use part of that is just being a good corporate citizen part of it is to um, accelerate the advent of the adoption of evs in our community and and part of it is just because we know that it's a negligible cost so that's actually been one of mm-hmm. you know the the least expensive you know marketing things we've ever done. We're very well known for it. There's almost always vehicles that aren't ours charging in our in our parking lot. Um, you know, we were on on plug share, so people would know how to find us. And uh, it's just created a really great sense of um, community. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we get a lot of just you know, it's just goodwill we get from, you know, I, you know, as I leave for the day, I, I'm talking to these people that are coming into our parking lot, plugging in their cars and just, how'd you hear about us? What, you know, what brought you here? And, and it just engages them in conversation. And, uh, but it's so, so that in itself has kind of built community around us. And, and so we're quite well known in our little city of Richmond for, for being guys that, um, that allow, uh, you know, anyone to charge in our, in our facility. But, what I can tell you is that because of all, when we first moved into our, our facility, a huge facility with, you know, a, a huge consumption of, of, of natural gas to heat and cool. And that was and in 2015, the, the, right? Yeah. And, and the lighting itself. So we had, you know, 60 plus metal halide lights in our warehouse. Well, those are huge draw. We, you know, we, we changed those all over to motion sensing LEDs. And so by adding these 18 EV chargers, we actually still haven't hit the same level of consumption that when we first moved into this facility and converted those lights. My electricity bills are uh, uh, the same as they were seven years ago, even though we've added these 18 chargers. So my point is, is that the cost has been negligible. The benefit to the community is immeasurable and the goodwill that it generates um, is just something that people are talking about and, and we feel great about. It, it's a really good feeling to know that we're, you know, we're taking a leadership role in there. And, you know, we just, we just really believe that it's better to lead than to follow. I th- that's on, that's uh, incredible. I think that's really true. And there are a lot of people that don't have uh, the willingness to take that first step without having seen someone else do it before. And not only is that a, not just a, a friend or someone across the street, that is a, a private enterprise, a private company willing to do so and take that risk. And I think that's a really, really great story. Um, and uh, I think that a lot of people would ultimately commend you guys for doing so. And, and also the recognition that it's it's not really that painful for the company at the end of the day to offer such a uh, unique and uh, helpful service to the local community. So I'm uh, really uh, inspired by that. Jamie, I understand that uh, um, PPCR is actually part of a larger group or there is some uh, connection with you personally with a wider group of restoration companies and that you've actually made some headway in helping some of these other groups also understand really what you're doing with your company and helping with some of the sustainability initiatives and, and understanding how those do or don't affect the bottom line for you. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about really what you've been doing for those groups groups because I think a lot of other companies uh, in a variety of industries could learn a lot from your guys' lessons here. So 
Um, can you take a minute and just kind of explain really where you guys are in that process and uh, what you've done for other groups? Yeah, yeah, sure. So you know, we're now seven offices, but in 2019, we were just the single office. So we've expanded fairly quickly in a fairly short period of time. Our other offices are in Calgary, Alberta, Canmore, in Alberta, on Vancouver Island. So we're you know over a fairly wide geographical area. Um, when we uh, brought these other organizations into our group, it was very important to us that they were all Climate Smart certified as well, and that they all understood what their greenhouse gas emission sources were, uh, they, that they had a baseline to measure their carbon footprint, and so you know we we formed a little cohort of our of our own um, you know offices, and we we all became Climate Smart certified, so we can say that that moving forward, but we're also part of a larger uh, cross Canada association of restoration contractors called GUS. And that's a Quebec based uh, organization and with over 150 offices. And through our affiliation with them and, and, and our passion for being sustainable and, and, and bringing these concepts to the regular day to day business of restoration, We've inspired that group to want to form a national sustainability program, uh, which would be the first of its kind. Uh, and, you know, so I'm, I'm in the midst of developing that with, you know, a, a core group of the people of, uh, from there. But I'm, I'm leading that in that we're trying to come up with our own type of certification where we can all, you know, follow a, a list of, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas reduction ideas or you know from a checklist of here's some things that you can do and so that we can all collectively make a huge impact on on reducing our carbon footprint as a whole and making an impact in our industry one of our stated goals is to elevate our industry and, and that's you know one of the ways we can do that is to bring sustainability to those other offices and to those other businesses um, I can tell you that it's it's not as easy as it sounds. We failed a couple of times. It's been difficult. Um, it's not easy to get people to grasp the importance and why this is a you know uh, you know a planet. You know, there's no business on a dead planet. So you know, trying to help people understand these things is not as easy as it sounds, especially in the rural communities, the smaller offices, the people that see this as oh, it's just another expense I've got to absorb. Um, so. You know, we're really that we're we're at this next phase of 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 our growth and sustainability, and trying to bring this to a wider group. Having somebody like you know the Climate Smart or the Green Business Bureau in the states, uh, having them as a third party verification in this, it kind of validates what we're doing. We're not just saying it; uh, we're actually able to have a third party show and demonstrate that we've actually made an impact. And you know, if we can get that happening throughout that wider group yeah you know, what a big difference that will make to the planet you know uh, and and so ultimately that's my goal is to try to uh, take this small uh, success story that we've had at, at, at PPCR bring that to a wider group and then demonstrate you know in a measurable way uh, how we're you know impacting sustainable business practices in our industry so just to, just to clarify too, the Gus Group is a, a group of other restoration companies. These That's are right. people that may or may not inherently be competitive by nature. And so your your uh, what you're deciding to do here is really a philosophy of uh, all if rising tides lifts all boats here, where a shared allocation of understanding on sustainability initiatives can really uh, have a meaningful impact on a, on an industry wide scale. Here is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think of it this way that you know, um, you know, we have uh, the British Columbia Construction Safety Alliance that we're uh, uh, you know that mm -hmm. we participate in, and 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 so we we have a a subgroup of all restoration contractors. All of my competition, uh, all of the other restoration contractors in our uh, province, subscribe to that Construction Safety Alliance, and so we you know we've chosen as an industry to not compete on safety. And what I'm trying to do is, what I'd love to see happen is, is take that same approach to sustainability. You know, if we could just all work towards this and not see it as a, a competitive edge, but more mm -hmm. as a collective potential uh, that we can all 
um, make an impact if we if we if we don't compete on these things. You know, I believe that it it, it could be you know an amazing result. And so when we think of it, um, you know, across this Gus group uh, of 150 other offices, you know, think of the impact that could be if we weren't competing on these on this level. You know, it's it's uh, to me, you know, it feels like we could change the world. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, again, you know, as as big as it seems, it's also just one particular industry, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very good uh, lesson learned opportunity there amongst many industries. I think about it of, of, of my own and ways that I could hopefully streamline uh, things that ultimately um, help the planet amongst my own particular industry because we speak the same lingo and we understand each other's worlds. And I think that's a, a really good opportunity to help uh, kind of move the needle on the uh, climate change state of affairs uh, for, for each of us. And so, you know, the uh, the other surprising element of that is, is the willingness of buy-in too. People really do want to learn more about what each other are doing, what makes the most sense, uh, not just on the bottom line, but for climate change across the whole. So I, I feel like that it uh, that opportunity it feels almost olive branchy but it's not right i think there's a, a collective working group effort and interest amongst industry certainly amongst competitors to really collaborate and work better to make uh you know everyone more successful at the end of the day yeah i i mean let, let's be frank every single business that we know of has somebody that's a climate champion that wants to mm-hmm. make a difference everybody has somebody in their business like i mean it's it's this thing that's uh, that more people want to do what they you know it's it's human nature is that we want to do something better for the for ourselves and for the planet and for our community and so you know i we also view it as you know that's for us it's a real you know employee attraction you know it's it's a recruitment strategy in its own way without you know stating that or 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 making it public but People that see what we're doing and that want to do that are attracted to us, and we're and and so we're we're not faced with this same you know great resignation that lots of other businesses and industries have been subject to. We we haven't had uh, you know staffing issues, and so my connection there is that people want this and they want to work for a business that's purpose driven, that has these goals and values, and that is working towards making the world a better place that's where the youth of today want to be employed and so it's not only self-perpetuating an employee retention strategy uh it 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 kind of grows exponentially the more people that we get that come and join our organization that have this mindset uh, makes it easier to make a bigger impact so it's really kind of cool how it self perpetuates and, and it just kind of grows like a, an amoeba. Jamie, similarly in the EV space, you know, certainly in California, Oregon, Washington, uh, the, the US states right now, there are active low carbon fuel standards, which do have a pretty meaningful influence on the bottom line of EV procurement. It certainly helps shake out uh, TCO analysis, if nothing else. Um, they're one of the most meaningful incentives available to fleets uh, today. I know that you guys are starting to uh, understand that, experiment with that. British Columbia now has electrification provisions within the low carbon fuel standard in British Columbia. Um, can you talk a little bit about your guys' participation in that and uh, what kind of influence that's having on your decision making for uh, future acquisition and, and rollout of EVs? Yes, certainly. Uh, it, it's all relatively new to us. Uh, you know, British Columbia is kind of leading the way. We, we're kind of piloting the program through with another group called Radical Climate Smart. They're helping us to uh, adopt the low carbon fuel standard. In a nutshell, our understanding is that, you know, by providing our own vehicles with a low carbon fuel, i.e. electricity, rather than filling up our cars with uh, fossil fuels, we have basically become a low carbon fuel distributor that makes us eligible to generate our own carbon credits and uh and therefore create an opportunity an economic opportunity that was unasked for unlooked for we didn't even know it was there um so you know we anticipate that this could bring us just through the simple action of elect of charging our evs at our facility you know this we're, we're talking about um 40 to sixty thousand dollars revenue annually um in generation of carbon credits. So it's a remarkable program. I think this is the one thing that's gonna really accelerate the adoption of fleets uh, in in Canada, certainly. I think once people figure it out and, and recognize that th- this is an opportunity that's available to them, 
it's going to make electrifying fleets a lot easier, a lot more accessible, and a lot more um, economically viable. Yeah, yeah, I know they've been very, very meaningful uh, south of the border for sure. And I think that uh, we're equally excited to see it happen in BC. There's another program very similar opening federally for Canada in the middle of this particular year. And the idea here is that, yeah, it's really meant to help offset that fuel cost, that electricity as a fuel cost uh, for electric fleets. And when you add that up over time, it's quite substantial. It can uh, be quite uh, it can be orders of magnitude more influential than any particular incentive made available even. So it's great to hear that you guys are uh, participating in that. It's also a good lesson, a good word to the wise there that the energy consumption data is the important element there, right? I think that that was kind of a, a thing to note that you guys um, had to go with a network system and also as part of the decision making on the charging systems going in, if you want to participate, you really have to ensure that you're selecting the right hardware or have a way to go about metering or some other element there to make sure you're capitalizing on the low carbon fuel standard. That's right. And it is confusing uh, for a lot of people. There is a lot of hoops to jump through to get uh, uh, registered and, and, uh, and participate in the program. Um, so what we hope is that, you know, we're going to clear a lot of those hurdles so that, you know, other companies uh, mm. can, can jump on board a little easier and, uh, and, and we can be an example for others to follow. Yeah, that's fantastic. Jamie, I just want to bring this full circle too. So obviously you're, you're making a lot of uh, wonderful connections uh, between really the business case here um, and sustainability. Um, you know, sustainability, I think now as you're demonstrating is really interwoven amongst uh, workforce development and energy energy policy internally and uh, and uh, all sorts of different elements for for businesses and I think that you know whether you're out in the warehouse or you're in the back office in the C suites you know you're having some sort of a decision making going on internally about how to tackle sustainability these days and it also feels though that there is just a, a, a tidal wave, maybe a bad pun uh, considering the topic, but a, uh, a tidal wave of information out there and no one is really sure where to start. Um, I think that people um, are very gun shy about pulling the trigger on anything because they are really not sure what to do after they've started their first Google. And so considering you guys are quite far down the road here and um, have already gained a lot of experience and understand next steps and uh, have goals in place for fleet electrification and all manner of things. If you were to give one uh, kind of closing remark or one last uh, point of advice to a new company that is looking to jump in, what would you suggest as a good uh, next step or idea? Yeah, you just have to start. You have to do something, not nothing. Uh, you know, that's really a, an, an important concept that, you know, start with a, a something as simple as creating a recycling area in the kitchen in your in your office. Uh, everybody has a responsibility to this planet. And so any step that you take is going to make a difference. And so it doesn't matter how small that step is, you got to take it. And and I'll, and I'll say also, uh, don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. Trying mm. to figure out, oh, geez, jump this way, jump that way. Oh, is it is it the right thing for us to do? You have to take some risk. You have to try some of these things out. If you can just avoid listening to the, you know, the the misinformation that's out there, particularly about EVs, have an open mind and and have that mindset of doing the right thing and doing something and not nothing. Uh, that's a, a recurring theme, I think, with our guests on this particular show is that the worst thing you can do is wait. You know, don't let the uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Don't let analysis paralysis stop you. You know, just just try something and that will get you moving that the writer's block. I think that happens often as people try to understand what to do with sustainability or ESG or scoping plan analysis or whatever um, definitely occurs. But I think it's the any of the incremental first steps that just get that momentum going just a tiny little bit will be enough, uh, it sounds like. And I, uh, I agree. I think that's quite sage advice. So, Jamie, I want to say thank you very much for attending the podcast today. Uh, I'm very happy about uh, all the progress made that uh, Platinum Pro Claim restoration has made over the years. And we're looking forward very much to hearing more about your continued deployments and uh, your thought leadership in the space of, uh, of all things uh, greenhouse gas reduction, but certainly in the restoration ecosystem. So, Jamie, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, being brought onto your podcast. It 
anything we can do to help elevate uh, electrification and sustainability, we're happy to be involved in. Sounds great. And to the listener, thank you for tuning into the Charge Cycle, where we talk all things fleet electrification. We'll be back next time. And until then, get out there and get plugged in.